I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, it's Adrian here from the Aussie Wildlife Show, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Dr. John Wamsley. And John was the Prime Minister's Environmentalist of the Year in 2003. He set up a lot of feral-free sanctuaries across Australia, literally bringing species back from extinction and caused a nationwide stir when he attended a tourism awards ceremony wearing a hat made from the pelt of a dead feral cat. Now, that led to the change in the law allowing feral cats to be legally killed. John, thank you for having us, mate. G'day, Adrian. G'day, Steve. Now, we're sitting in your awesome backyard. Now, your property is, I've known it for the last 10, 12 years, just an incredible place. It's a stringy bark forest. I should probably let you talk about it, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, a, it's got an interesting history. I, when I finished building sanctuaries, I went, I, well, basically retired, I suppose. I, I've always wondered whether you could tell, I knew you could turn a, a hectare of bushland, pristine bushland, into, into a garden, an English garden. You could do very easily, but I wondered whether you could ever turn it back because this was an English garden that had been set up and... It had liquid ambers and everything planted all over it and an irrigation system put in it. And so I wondered whether you could ever turn back what had been made as a conventional garden into into bush. And so this was my, uh, I suppose, an experiment to do that. And it worked very well. There's, I don't know, I think over 400 species of indigenous plants growing here naturally. And there's over about 50 species of native orchid, for example, growing on the block naturally and they came themselves and so it's all been a it's been an exciting project it was too hard it was a waste of time really i'd have been better off spending the time looking after a bit of bush that was already there and stopping it from degrading but I, it's sort of a nice place for me to live i can actually go outside now and not get upset with what's going on out there because it's quite nice well, I remember I asked you once, why, why do you do it? I mean, I'm, I'm in the same vein. I've, you've inspired me, and um, I would last year bought three acres of bush, and I'd, I love restoring it. And the answer you gave me at the time was, so you can sleep at night. Yeah, it's a bit like that. This all started with me. I've got two great loves in life, I suppose. One's mathematics, and the other's is the Australian bush. And when I came here, I decided I'd combine both of them. I got a job at Flinders University teaching mathematics and I bought what was to become Warrawong Sanctuary. Now, when I bought Warrawong Sanctuary, Stock Road, which is Warrawong Sanctuary, or Warrawong Front, Stock Road, Stock Road's a road three kilometres long, runs from uh, Longwood down to Mylor. There are 45 species, in 1970 there were 45 species of native orchid growing down the edges of Stock Road and they all went 10 years later. 1969 there were 70, there were 45 species, 1980 there were basically none, they'd gone. There's still a few but they're basically gone and that concerned me. I saw that happen and I wondered why I was disappointed at that it happened and it didn't happen because someone was destroying them or anything it in fact happened because we changed the law potentially to save things like that from happening stop that from happening and yet the actual way we did things and to make life better for the environment actually made things worse and that caused me a lot of thinking I suppose and from that, my life sort of changed a bit, and so things like Warrawong Sanctuary happened, and then this happened. But it was all about trying to understand what the Australian bush was and why it was we were losing it. Because I think that was the biggest thing was the fact that it was going, and I saw it going, and nobody cared. Nobody, nobody cared. No one noticed. You, you, you grew up on a good couple of a hundred acres of bush in New South Wales, I believe. Yeah, when I was uh, seven, my father bought 166 acres of virgin bushland and cleared 35 acres of it and planted an orchard. And I grew up in that bush, and the bush went on forever then. And so I, uh, 
Yeah, I grew up with a great affinity for the bush, although I never tried to understand it. I just loved it at that stage and always spent very much... I was very much at ease in the bush, just on my own in the bush. I found a very nice place to be, whereas in, with masses of people in the city, I never found very pleasant. So I suppose that's where it all started. And then when I saw the bush disappearing, I, I thought that perhaps I should do something about it. And I suppose my life since then was about trying to work out how to save the bush and to try and be involved in saving it, I guess. How to reverse the trends. Um, it's, it's interesting because you notice these orcas disappearing on, say, Stock Road. A lot of people would just drive past and go, oh, look, I'm in the country, there's some gum trees, there's some birds, and they don't notice the complex biodiversity. And people certainly notice when an animal disappears or if a landscape gets completely cleared, but not too many people really get up close and have a look. And when you are aware, it is heartbreaking because it's not a sexy message for people. People want to throw money at save the whatever, whatever, something cute and fluffy. But um, when it comes to biodiversity and habitat, it's a harder sell, isn't it? Yeah, in uh, I think in the 1970s, a good example of that is 1970s, uh, uh, there was a local artist here who painted a, uh, a painting which I inherited. I've got it. It's inside there. I could show it to you. But it's a landscape with a with a thing on it that sort of says, you know, we're destroying this. We shouldn't do this. I, in fact, donated it to Stirling Council, but they refused to accept that. They got a bit of publicity. And it was written up in both the Courier, our local paper, and by the advertiser. And I can't remember which is which, but one one story described this painting as a degraded landscape and the other one described it as pristine bushland. <laughs> and so here was a painting that the people who looked at it didn't, couldn't, didn't understand or, or were confused as to whether this was degraded land or pristine bushland. And that's one of the problems I have because I go into a lot of bushland, which most people had called pristine bushland, and for me it's extraordinarily degraded because it's gone, basically. And so it is, it is a difficult one. And so trying to understand the bush and trying to explain to people what the bush is and how, what the bush is all about is very difficult because most people don't understand what the bush is. They don't understand what it should be or anything. And so it's, the question starts, I suppose, is what do we mean by bush? And the point is that you can go anywhere in the world and take any bit of land, any hectare of land in the world. And through evolution, that area evolved to be a very special hectare of land that was basically different to any other hectare of land, had different things living there. And so these things, and the big difference, I guess, between this land, I suppose, natural land, we'll call it, and unnatural land like an English garden, for example, the big difference between our bush and a conventional garden is a conventional garden is a collection of plants and or animals, whereas a bush is a community of living organisms, each one dependent on the other and each supporting the others. And these are two quite different things. And what's happening everywhere in the world up until some a few thousand years ago, every hectare of land in the world was a community of living organisms and a different community, although some were very similar to others. But And we're gradually losing all of them. Every day, more of those communities are destroyed and none are replaced. So we're gradually making the earth a more and more barren place. And that's what's happening. Now, what do we do about that? Well, all I can do about that is to try and show people what, I'm, what I mean by this community of living things and what it's all about. And one of the things that I did here was to, in effect, what I did, I took a degraded landscape and turned it back into a living community. And I wasn't sure whether you could do that or not. And you can, but it probably isn't worth the effort, as I said it's probably better to look after the ones we've already got because we're gradually losing them. And you can see what's happening is that, for example, if you take, well, the Allgate Valley, for example, the Allgate Valley would have had, I don't know, 500 species of plants growing in it, different species, if you go back 200 years. You can still find 500 species of plants growing here if you go in it, but they're not all, say, the Allgate Valley wouldn't have them. 
did it, it might have instead of having 500 now it's got 50 and so each area if you go further you can still find these species that we're not actually getting many extinctions as such but we're getting them having to go further and further for example if you take our native orchids here the, the if you take the king spider orchid for example it's pollinated by a wasp and if you go closer to Adelaide, you can find the king spider orchid, but it's not being pollinated anymore. Whereas you move away from Adelaide and you'll get to a point where the king spider orchid is still being pollinated. We're just on the edge here. Some years it's pollinated and some years it's not. You go further away from Adelaide and it's being pollinated all the time. So, and that spot where that pollination is happening is gradually moving further and further from Adelaide. So you can, you can actually work out when there'll be no more native orchids left in South Australia because of this gradually moving. And it's up to us when that happens because if we make Adelaide big enough so it covers the whole of South Australia, which seems to be the aim of the authorities here, that we're going to lose everything. And that saddens me, I guess. Yeah. What can we do about it? What's the best thing we can do? <coughs> I think the first thing is to understand what we mean by communities and to try and to try and I think if we if people understood the damage they were causing um, I got into a lot of trouble in the 1970s trying to save our road verges because of what happened in Stock Road and now there's no point saving our road verges because there aren't any left in the for example our council this Allgate Valley now it would be difficult to find many road verges that have any semblance of a community of living organisms left on it. It's all been destroyed and it seems to be that that's the way we go. I don't know how we stop it. I, I've tried to buy education to show people what's there and people sort of quite interesting. This. They, uh, they'll go and they'll talk about the importance of these communities and then you go to their house and you find out they haven't got... They've got nothing there. They've just got a barren bit of English garden or something there. So people have got one view they talk about, but their actions are different. So actually, I don't know. I've spent my life trying to educate people about these, the importance of these things. But And I, you can see some progress is made, but we're going, still going backwards. We're still losing species at a very fast rate. And Australia has the worst record in the world for loss of species. And you can compare it, for example, if you compare it with something we get very excited about, and that's, uh, that's climate change. Now, Australia, we, we Australia is responsible for about 1% of the world's creation of greenhouse gases. So we're, if you like, 1% responsible for that. We spend billions and billions of dollars a year to do something about that, which is fine. I've got no problem with that. But we're responsible for about 8% of the world's loss of biodiversity. And we've done nothing on that, virtually, compared with the other. It's nothing. So we've got funny things. We can only, as the Americans would say, we haven't learnt yet to walk and chew gum at the same time. We can only look after one problem at a time. And if we're going to care for our environment, we've got to learn to look after a few more. I think the biggest problem facing the world today is loss of biodiversity. Do you think um, <clears throat> human overpopulation plays a big role in that? Well, it's it's the ever increasing population that's the problem. That that uh, up until a few thousand years ago, we were living in balance with the environment, if you like. And it's like if you go to a wombat warren now and look at it, you'll get about a hundred metres across. They are here in South Australia, and they can be totally degraded on what's on them because there's wombats living there. But that's the total extent of their degradation over there. Everything's fine. And I suppose up until a few thousand years ago, there were patches of communities of people living that had sort of destroyed their patch. But most of the world was OK. But now we're destroying it all. We're gradually spreading out. And with population growth, there is no other answer than we're going to destroy it all. There's no, no other way we're going. I love what you've done here, John, with, like we've talked about with your garden because you've got the, the native bush here that you've put back and you grow your own food and the fact that you open up to the native garden scheme. Is that what it's called? The open I have garden been scheme? part of the open garden scheme for a while, but I, I'm not doing that now. I'm getting too old, I suppose, 
to, to it took a lot of effort to put in that extra bit I actually when I finished here and I don't do much here now it's pretty well self-sustaining now but I moved on I thought well how do I do this in a bigger scale and so I became a friend of Scott Creek Conservation Park and I'm trying to do what I did here on a hectare I'm trying to do on 700 hectares down there I suppose but it's it's going very well there's creeks there I pick a Almanda Creek for example it was all blackberries when I took on the job of fixing it up and now it's a beautiful spot there's there'd be I don't know 50 species of rare plants growing naturally along the creek down there it's an absolutely wonderful spot so so these things are lovely. I don't understand. Our big problem is getting people to help, and I don't understand why we can't get more support. Because I'm sure that if they knew what was how wonderful it was looking after these natural gardens, it's much more pleasing than looking after an English garden. I think I can guarantee you that. But so it's, so it's education that's the key, isn't it? It's people knowing, understanding, but of course, as we, cities grow and as more and more of our population live in the cities, there's less and less people understand what the environment is really all about. And most of the people making decisions about the environment are city slickers who don't understand the environment, and that's one of our problems, I guess. I think, like um, with the with the education that does go on now, I think more so in schools now than it ever has. Um, I think there's going to be a generation of people coming through willing to help um, and, and put more back into into places like Scott Creek. I, I hope, maybe I'm <laughs> being a yeah, bit well, over-romantic, but I just think that there could be a generation coming through. Yeah, that. yeah uh, I don't know, hopefully. Mm. It's interesting, though, because the younger generation is always very interested in the environment. Then you sort of get to a certain age where other things like earning a quid becomes yeah. more important than raising a family and you haven't got time for that then you get old like me now and you're back into the bush again I suppose (laughs) yes but there's a big gap we've got to somehow get people involved in look the only way to now save our bush you can't save our bush this concept that the bush looks after itself is nonsense it can't look after itself we've invaded it we've introduced all these terrible plants and animals into it that are destroying it if we're going to save the Australian bush, then we have to start what I call gardening our bush. We have to care for our bush, and for that we need people to do it. And One of the interesting things, they're talking about us all not having jobs soon. Well, I can give everyone a job. There's plenty of bush out there that needs caring for, so it's not as if there's nothing to do. It's just that mm. who's going to support us doing it, I suppose. Yeah, get out there and help. Um, when, when you're re like when you're working on Scott Creek and that, how, how much is involved? Is it all like weeding, taking out things that shouldn't be there, and then naturally everything comes back, or do you have to do some sort of planting? What, what's involved in it, John? We do do some. One of the problems is that I'm involved in doing wetlands to a large extent now because that's where our biggest problem is. Okay. One of the problems with climate change is that our wetlands are drying out. So in Scott Creek, we had a lot of highland bogs that are now disappearing because they're, what would you call it, they're solitary areas. The plants in one can't get to a lower area that's now suitable for them. So one of the things we're doing is trying to recreate the highland bogs down lower where there's still wetlands. And that basically involves the wetland ones were ones that were, the lower ones were ones that were farmed early and abandoned and are now just all weeds. So it's a matter of clearing out the weeds, bringing back the conditions that are necessary and moving the plants or growing the plants and spreading them down in the lower areas. And I guess that's basically what we're involved in now. Do you, do you have many species that actually just naturally come back unexpectedly? Or? Oh, yeah, a lot more than you imagine. Yeah. And, and they do. Here, most of the ones came back naturally. Hmm. Um, yeah, nature's pretty wonderful if you give it the opportunity. It's just that it does need a little bit of help, and we need to give it that help. So opinions have changed a fair bit. I think we should talk about some good news. I think there's been, although we could be doing more and we still are losing things and there's still work to be done, a lot's changed, hasn't it, John? I think since you started planting gum trees and pulling out pine trees. 
Oh, it definitely has. I remember in, uh, I don't know, about the middle of the 1970s somewhere there was on the front page of the Mount Barker Courier had a photo of a person crouched on the roadside among all these stakes where I'd planted, put back the bush, and it was titled A Picture of Despair After Years of Clearing His Roadside of Scrub. It has been replanted, and now everybody's replanting scrub. So, yeah, things have changed greatly. There's no doubt about that, and at least we've there's a bigger awareness and we understand it more too we know how to do it better but again it's a matter of I suppose getting more people to help is the problem How how did the locals feel back then when you were chopping down pine trees and planting native trees? Oh, I was I was a bit of an outsider in fact I was picked on fairly heavily I was I think uh, in the about, I don't know, it would have been about 1976 where Don Dunstan called a special meeting of the South Australian Executive Council and declared that I was an urban guerrilla and ordered the police commissioner to lock me up. And that was interesting times and I only knew what happened there because my I had a great friend just down the road, Keith Oliphant, whose brother Sir Mark Oliphant at the time was the governor of South Australia and as such was on the executive council. He was in fact the executive council was all about telling the governor what he should do. And uh, he uh, he telephoned his brother and said, what's your mate Wamsley up to? I've just been to a special meeting of the executive council and Don Dunstan and said he was an urban guerrilla and ordered the police commissioner to lock him up and Keith rung me up and said, you better keep your head down for a while, they're looking for you. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, I was. I was arrested and locked up for a while, but the uh, interesting thing was in 2003, I was awarded the Australian Environmentalist of the Year, the the Prime Minister's Award for Conservation and uh, for doing exactly the same thing as what Don Dunstan locked me up for, what, 20 years earlier. So, yes, certainly things are changing. Things have changed. Yeah. That's great. (laughs) And you really started to gather momentum when you started a sanctuary, a Warrawong sanctuary just down the road from here. Yeah, I think through the 1970s I could be described as I'd probably was a bit radicalised. I was pretty angry and I, I didn't have a very high opinion of my other homo sapiens around the place. But in the in the uh, 1980s it changed a bit. I changed from that. I actually developed this sanctuary which became Warrawong Sanctuary. And I think the big change was when I was the... Uh, Laurie Delroy was the head of the South Australian National Parks then and he bought me six brush tail betongs. Now brush tail betongs were the old about a hundred left in the world. They were heading for extinction. And he bought me these six betongs and he said, he gave them to me and said, the, this, you're the only chance that these betongs have. It's your job to save them. And in fact, I did. There's now about 100,000 brush tail betongs in the world because of what I showed. But anyway, but I picked one up and the bloody thing bit my finger. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a bit affronted with this. I thought, here I am, the saviour of them all, and they bloody things bit my finger and my first urge was to kick it to death of course but (laughs) then I thought no that's and I've learned since then that that's what betongs do if you pick one up they bite your finger there's they know nothing else and you won't get anything else from them and does that make betongs good or bad well it's irrelevant that's what betongs do and that made me think much and I, I decided that this is what people are on about why do people destroy my bush they destroy my bush because that's what people do. And the only way you're going to change that is by education. And that's really the reason why Warawong Sanctuary opened to the public. And it had an enormous impact on people because I could take them for a walk and I could show them what I was talking about. When you just talk about things and say, oh, these betongs should be saved, it's you know, it was hard because people would say, well, you, yeah, but you can't save them. The cats eat them, the foxes eat them. They've, they'll just go. But when you can take them out there and see hundreds of them hopping around, these tiny little kangaroos, and happy as Larry and doing what betongs do, then people take notice. And so I think it had a big change. It had a big effect on people, and hopefully it, it'll keep me going. It'll keep happening. Absolutely, yeah. I'm sure it will. So the brush-tailed betongs were the first species at Warrawong? They're the first rare species at Warrawong. That was the start of serious things, and there was a, quite a number of others followed that. Uh, and then I built Yukamara Sanctuary and Scotia Sanctuary, and there were all sorts of things, and there were... Uh, 
bow ring bedongs and, and numbats and booties, mala and uh, bridal nail tail. Well, the Scotia Sanctuary now has virtually the whole of the remaining population of bridal nail tail wallabies living there. Um, they're gone everywhere else now. So these sanctuaries are feral proof. So there's no cats, there's no foxes, there's no rabbits. All those animals have been eradicated mm. and, that's, and, and the animals then thrive within. Yeah, it's just that, that as far as Australian mammals are concerned, their problem was simply foxes and cats. There wasn't anything else. There was nothing else. that We were losing all these animals simply because of foxes and cats. Because yeah. I guess every other continent had cats for millennia and the animals... Yeah, well, yeah, these places all evolved differently and Australia was one of these places. New Zealand was another one. The Pacific Islands were another one. So the various islands, I suppose Australia had the island problem. It's, I think it's called the island problem whereby the species uh, evolved separately to the rest of the world. The rest of the world had their cats and their dogs and wild dogs and cats and things. We didn't have anything like a cat in Australia and uh, we brought them in and not only did we bring them in but we left them out there when we went through the rabbit plagues in the 1930s. They were actually catching cats in Adelaide and taking them and putting them on the wombat, on the cat, the rabbit warrens up north in an attempt to wipe out the, the rabbits. So and it was really the, the rabbit was probably the big vector that made it all work because the rabbit spread across Australia and as the rabbit spread across Australia, the fox and the cat followed and we ended up with this triad, if you like, a balance between foxes, cats and rabbits that didn't leave any other place for any other small mammals. Now, you really got the word out there to the country when you turned up at a tourism awards with a hat that was made out of a feral cat. Yeah, the, one of the things, when I did Scotia Sanctuary, one of the things you've got to remember on this was in the 1970s when I was doing all this, started all this, it was actually illegal. If I'd have applied for permission to build... Warrawong Sanctuary, then Warrawong Sanctuary would never have happened. That what I did at Warrawong Sanctuary was totally illegal. I didn't broadcast that fact, but the fact is that it, it happened. When I did Yukamara Sanctuary, it was done on a much bigger scale. There was uh, the fence at Warrawong I did by hand, I didn't use any machinery, I dug the post holes by hand, I built it by hand. Nobody noticed it happening. I built Warrawong without any great fanfare. I didn't intend to do anything with it other than to live there myself and enjoy it. And so it didn't take... It wasn't well known what I was doing. When I did Yokomura Sanctuary, on the other hand, though, it was different because I needed people to help me with funds. I needed funding to do it. I needed people to help me do it. So there was a bit of a fanfare on that and everybody knew what I was doing. And one of the things that happens with when everybody knows things, then there's a certain percentage of the community that doesn't want you to do it. Now, when I... Up there, I bought basically 3,000 acres of old-growth mallee. And that 3,000 acres of old-growth mallee, the main use for it, when I, before I changed it, when I first bought it, was growing pot. <laughs> <laughs> and you changed it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the people that were growing pot the la in there, using it to grow pot, the last thing they wanted was a fence around it that they couldn't get through. So they didn't like me doing it. And then as well as that, there are other people that had all sorts of reasons. One of the things that I was going to do, which was now publicly, was to get rid of all the cats there that lived there. Now, there weren't many cats lived on there because there wasn't much there at all. There were 6,000 rabbits, it turned out, I think, I had to get rid of. And there were about, I don't know, probably 20 foxes that I had to get rid of. And there were probably a dozen cats or something like that if I had to give numbers. But when I started, I built the fence and that sort of caused a bit of a stir. And that in itself was only because they, the locals decided I shouldn't build the fence. And they, in fact, had a beating there that I was invited to by, over the radio 
on the corner, I can remember the meeting on the corner of two roads there where, next to Yukamara Sanctuary. And this meeting was a public meeting to stop me building the fence. It was the, the equivalent of the greenies stopping a thing to happen. And when I got there, I turned up. I was, in fact, over somewhere else doing some work and I had to come home for this and I went up there. I got there in time for the meeting and it soon became apparent there were two lots of people there. There were people that called themselves greenies and didn't want like fences because they used to like wandering through the bush. And there were people called bikies who lived there because they grew pot and they didn't want the fences. But anyway... It came clear there were two distinct groups there and it soon became clear to me, very clear to me, that if there was going to be a fight, I wanted the bonkies on my side, not on the other side. So I very <laughs> carefully managed it so that suddenly the bikies start belting up the greenies and everybody pissed <laughs> off, you see. So that was the end of that public meeting. The next thing that happened, I built the fence and then I had to get rid of the foxes and cats and rabbits there. And it became known, and it was a reporter in the the Barossa and Light Herald who, in fact, works for the ABC now. He's, in fact, a, on the country radio. At that time, he was a reporter in the Barossa and Light Herald, and he wrote up, it hit the front page, and it was titled, Thousands of Animals Slaughtered at Mallee Sanctuary. And then on page 15 or something, it had that they were rabbits, but on the front page it had nothing. But, but the basic aim was the article was written in such a way that I was killing thousands of feral cats, you see. that's the Well, this attracted... We've got the cat lovers. The, uh, I don't know if you've ever, ever tried to say anything about how bad cats are, but the first thing you do if you do anything about that is you get this... Massive response comes from the Cat Lovers Society, which is a fairly powerful lobby. It's like the cat lobby in Australia is like the the Rifle Association in America to do with arms. It's a very similar thing. You can't get rid of guns in America because of the National Rifle Association. You can't get rid of cats. You can't do anything about cats in Australia because of the Cat Lovers Society. And it, it's fairly equivalent. So anyway, it turned out that it was at that time illegal to kill a feral cat. Uh, the way this worked was that a cat was a, a free animal and if I killed a feral cat and you said it was yours, then I'd killed your cat. You didn't have to prove it was your cat. You just had to say it was your cat, and by law it was your cat, and I'd killed your cat. And a person actually in Darwin actually went to jail for this. He killed a feral cat, and somebody said it was theirs, and the judge put him, magistrate put him in jail for it, for killing that bloke's cat, you see. So this was serious stuff. So this was sort of shaping up, and they'd set up a vigilante group to watch me, and if I killed a cat, they were going to have me, you see. So I had to do something about this. And at that time, the person I had destroying the cats and foxes and rabbits was a person called Adam O'Neill, who had just come down from the bush and he bought me this massive cat skin. And we were discussing what we were going to do. And that night, the, the tourism awards were on. And Prue took this cat skin and quickly made it into a hat and... <laughs> put it on my head and said, you're going to wear this tonight. It's Prue's fault. <laughs> it was all Prue's idea it was. So that night I wore it to the tourism awards. It was absolutely, I've got some beautiful videos on. I think you it's on You can go on website. YouTube and uh, yeah. John's website, go on YouTube, have a look at people's yeah. faces. <laughs> it, it was just unbelievable. It was it was incredible. And anyway, it was on the front page of the advertiser the next morning, of course. But the important thing was at the same time there was a meeting of tourism ministers from Australia were meeting in Adelaide to discuss various to, uh, environmental matters, environment ministers, sorry, and they put cats on the agenda and South Australia actually changed the law then that you could destroy feral cats in a sanctuary or a national park. So I was able to then remove the cats from 
from, legally from Yukamura Sanctuary. Otherwise, Yukamura Sanctuary wouldn't have happened. So that's what that was all about. The other interesting thing was as this story spread, I knew where it had got to because of the death threats that I was getting, where the death threats were <laughs> <Wow>. coming from. <laughs> and that the uh, our NRA, the uh, Cat Lovers Society, what would you call that, the C CLS or something, it... Uh, it was outraged and they launched an incredible attack on me, which is still continuing today. And it was interesting. They got a lot of support. They got people like Darren Hinch on side who, who sort of screwed me on his television program. So I come under a fair bit of attack over that, and I still do. Well, I'm so glad you did that, mate. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you from all the sensible, intelligent Australians. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, going back to Warrawong, you ended up getting platypus. How, how hard was it to get permission to be able to have platypus in the uh, sanctuary? Platypus, it, the approval to get platypus for Warrawong took about five years. When I first approached the National Parks about it, it was a clear no. Uh, you couldn't do this sort of thing. So I had to make a case. I actually got a group of people together. I formed the subcommittee of friends, if you like. I called it the get, bring back planet, bring platypus back to the Adelaide Hills, and that was their job as a committee. And So we exerted a fair bit of political pressure on, on the government. I put forward a pretty good case for it, and after, as I say, after about, and after I started, by this time I'm winning tourism awards too, which made a big difference. We were judged South Australia's top tourism place, Warrawa. And so in the end, I got approval to get some platypus. And so that, and that was exciting times because I'd never caught, up until then, I'd never caught a platypus. And we got approval to go over. There were platypus who were put on kangaroo oil and they were, they were feral animals on Platypus Island, on Kangaroo Island. They weren't natural there. They were put there by David Flay in the 1940s and that worked very well. Um, I did spend, as part of my getting ready for them, I spent about a month sitting on the banks of, of uh, Rocky River on Kangaroo Island watching platypus to try and understand them. I did, uh, I did water tests and mud tests and that and developed the Blackwater Lake at Warong to be exactly the same as the main pool in the Rocky River where the platypus lived. Got the pH the same by putting limestone rocks down down the things and everything. It was quite a big job. And uh, then went over, it was quite interesting, went over to get our platypus. I had a permit to take, I think, three platypus the first time. So we went over there. Um, Channel 7 uh, sponsored the whole thing which was Channel 10 then so you've got to be careful there you, Channel 10 actually sponsored the, uh, the getting the platypus they, because I didn't know how hard they were to move I didn't want a, the job of getting I knew they were pretty hard to, that they'd die from stress pretty easily most animals do if you put them under extreme problems so the idea was that we trap them, catch them at night. First thing in the morning, they go. I take them to the Kangaroo Island Airport. A helicopter, the Channel 10 helicopter, picks them up there. Or it was the Channel 7 helicopter then, but a Channel 10 helicopter picks them up and brings them here to Warrawong, and we put them there. So it was all well, well uh, worked out. The only problem was we had to catch these platypus. I didn't have anyone with me. I that had ever caught a platypus before. We knew the theory of catching platypus. Tom Grant had caught for a few and he was sort of in charge of the operation, but he couldn't be there because he was had something to do in Sydney or something. So anyway, we ended up on Kangaroo Island to catch these platypus. We had these nets and everything. Now, fortunately, or what I thought was fortunately, when the television crew turned up to, who was going to, the Channel 10 uh, television crew turned up to film it all as part of their deal. They got the film rights on it. One of the people with them had actually been... 
he said, catching platypus. He'd actually caught platypus, and I thought, well, isn't this wonderful? <laughs> so anyway, we set up down at the on the creek, which is all Rocky River is. It's really just a bit of a creek. <laughs> and uh, But it was up in the upper reaches of the Rocky River. And I sat there. It was a freezing cold night. And uh, we had the nets out, and we had them out from about dusk, and got to about midnight and there'd been no sign of any platypus and I, I'm not a good one at staying up all night so I said well look I left this bloke in charge that knew all about catching platypus and went up and thought I'd have a bit of a couple of hours sleep. Anyway they woke me up about oh, one o'clock, half past one in the morning that they'd nearly caught a platypus <laughs> that one had gone in nets and in fact they had it all on film, this nearly catching a platypus. What happened? The platypus went into the net and this bloke's there poking it with his finger and jumping back each time it moved. This platypus catch. He'd never caught a platypus in his life. He'd only seen others catch it. And then, then he'd suddenly realised that platypus have this poisonous spur. He wasn't going to touch a bloody platypus. And he just poked it with his finger and jumped back until it got away. And that was his <laughs> attempt to catch it. So I told him he could, get, after learning this, I told him he could go and have a sleep and I'd stay there. So everyone went and I was sat there on my own and it was two o'clock in the morning. There was a, I heard a plop at the end of the pool and I knew there was a platypus in the pool and I froze and I could see the shimmering water. I knew where it was and it was in the net, and I jumped into the water and wrapped it up in the net. I had my platypus, the first one. But anyway, the other point was that I was then soaked to the skin and it was a freezing cold night, and it was, I had a pretty bad night after that. I froze all night, but anyway. But I had my platypus, and then the other group got one and we'd split into two groups and then in the morning the ranger came to see how we were going and he bought another one, a little one that he'd caught crossing at one of the crossings that he just picked it up Wow! <laughs> so I ended up with three female platypus Fantastic. Uh, brought them back uh, came back in the helicopter and put them in the dam and the next year we went over and got two miles, little miles, and brought back. And by that time I'd fixed up the swamp, changed it so it was suitable for platypus, and we put those two platypus in the swamp. And it was interesting because the next year nothing had happened, but the next year their babies appeared. And that was interesting because it was thought until then that male platypuses couldn't breed until they were three-year-old and he's bred at two-year-old. So obviously with no other males to annoy him and with a couple of elder girls there to show him how to do it, they, anyway, they seem to do the job well. It's a lot easier for him, yeah. And two baby platypus were in the, in the creek and, and uh, one of the staff said she reckoned there was little platypus said I went down and there they were, two of them. So, of course, nobody believed us because at that stage everybody thought, well, I think Flay was the only one that had ever bred a platypus in captivity. And uh, he tried, spent the rest of his life trying to repeat it and couldn't. And so they, we had to prove that we had platypus. Tom Grant came over and we, caught, we actually caught them and so on camera holding them up. Two baby platypus. So that was good stuff. That's fantastic. And we were catching platypus. After we put them there, we caught them each year and checked on them. And so we knew how they were going and that. So we'd done a lot of platypus catching by then and we caught the little ones without any trouble. How long ago was that, John? Oh, that was in the early 1990s, 1990 sometime. And then every year since they're bred, they're still breeding every year. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so Warrawong wasn't set up for them to start with. You had to... Oh, it all was built. Uh, oh, yeah, it was all built. To... Purpose built for the platypus, yeah. So the big lake down the bottom, is that Black yeah. Lake? Or yeah, it was all dig built. all that out? And... No, that was, I built everything. Everything at Warrawong built. There's nothing natural at Warrawong. All the water systems are built. 
all the trees are planted. There wasn't a tree on Nothing, it, basically. Yeah. So everything there is man-made. Wow. Yeah. It was a dairy farm originally. Yeah, it was a dairy farm when I bought it. The first thing I did was sell the milking machine so I wouldn't be tempted to <laughs> do dairy. <laughs> what a success. Wow. Yeah. I think one of the neighbours said to you something along the lines of the previous owner just finished clearing all this and now you're putting trees back. Oh, yeah, I used to get into <laughs> trouble there because I... Yes, they did. They, they put in a lot of effort, I suppose, doing that work. But yeah, I, when I planted, the, a lot of the planting you couldn't see where I was doing it because it was away from the road. But when I planted the section that hill on Williams Road, there was, uh, I think it was Sid Mago walked past. He owned the piggery over the road, and he uh, yelled out at me. He just, oh, I heard this voice yell out, "You bastard!" <laughs> <laughs> I looked up and I said, G'day, Sid, how you going? He said, you rotten bastard. He said, old Stoney spent his whole life clearing that hillside and you've planted it back again. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but that's the way they thought at that time, that this was terrible things we did. Education. It has come a long way. We, like, we have environmental management and conservation land management studies now at TAFE and at uni. But like you said, you, you, you get these experts that lecture in some of these subjects and you go to their homes and they've got an English garden. It's, um... Yeah, yeah, they're not serious. And this is the problem, you see, that we know more, we, 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 we understand more, we want to do it more, but we're losing it faster than ever because the other side's happening, you see. And we're not losing our bush because of somebody destroying it. We're losing our bush because we've changed its management. So an area of land responds to how you manage it. Well, this is a vegetable garden here. We grow vegetables here. Now, if you walked away from that, they, they only can survive because we put the input caring for it. If we didn't touch this vegetable garden for a few years, this would be a terrible mess here wouldn't be a vegetable garden producing food it'd be a massive i don't know blackberries or something mm. so that that's there because of the management it gets and so is our bush there because of the management it gets. the bush wants to do certain things like that wants to do certain things if you leave that to its own resource it wants to grow weeds that's what it wants to do i stop it from doing that the bush also has a mind of its own. The bush is trying to do something and then it gets things impinging on it which exerts a management on it. Now, if you go back 200 years, there was Aboriginals burning it and hunting in it and there were all these things like here, the Tamil wallabies, the forest grazers, and there were all bilbies and all sorts of things out there living in the bush. That gave it a management that resulted in it being what it was when we came here. Now, we've changed all that. We've taken all that away. The bush that now gets no management. And no management is the same as me trying to grow this a vegetable garden with no management. It wouldn't work. We can't have our bush out there like it should be with no management. What we end up with is this bloody great fire hazard. Now, natural bush isn't a fire hazard. We, it's a fire hazard now because it doesn't get any management. And it's going to, we either got to put back the management it had or we have to put something in place. We have to work out what we want it to be. We've never worked it out. We haven't got to that stage yet. So the present thing, belief, is that if you leave it alone and don't do anything, it'll be all right. Well, it won't be. Our bush can't won't work if we just leave it. So our national parks that get no management are gradually degrading. We're gradually losing the biodiversity. It's fairly slow. From year to year, you don't notice it. It was just that stock road was very quick. Why was stock road very quick? Why did the orchids disappear from stock road? The orchids disappeared from stock road because they suddenly decided to make it unlawful for the farmers, the landholders, to put their stock out on Stock Road. They used to put their stock out on Stock Road when they 
certain times when they needed that. That's why the orchids were there. They changed that. They, in fact, changed the land holding that you couldn't have a piggery anymore in here because it's a catchment area. So farming basically stopped here because of the catchment area. Poultries had to go, pigs had to go. I think horses hung on for a while, but now you've even got problems having anything here. So nobody put anything out onto Stock Road anymore. All man the management changed on Stock Road. The grassland went, the scrub came back, the orchids went. Not because someone destroyed it, but because we changed the management. We have to first of all decide what do we want our bush to be? Do we want our bush to run on a fire cycle where it burns every 20, 30, 40 years, a great fire goes through it and its biodiversity is gone, basically, or do what do we want? Nobody decides. All over the world this is happening, not just Australia. The whole world of natural bushland, if you like, is going into a fire cycle because that's all we understand now. That's all. F Sorry, John. Uh, Fifteen years ago, you said to me about native woody weeds, which I, I thought was a fantastic way to look at it, and you were talking about things like pioneering plants like acacias and tea mm. trees and that shrub layer. And just coming back to you talking about combustibles in the bush, and if once they were grazed or burnt, but if you allow them to persist in a garden or a bushland environment, you lose all your ground covers, all your orchids, all your lilies, your forbs, your little pea flowers, your biodiversity, yeah. basically. Well, you can get the best way you can look at this is just look at the species of plants that grow here naturally in the Allgate Valley. So we're in the Allgate Valley. In the Allgate Valley, you've got, I don't know, about 500 species of plants in the Allgate Valley. The 80% of those plants are what I would call or what everyone calls grassland plants. They're not grasses. It's a bit of a misnomer, grasslands, because the main plants in grassland aren't grasses. They are if you look at the African veldt or the American prairie. But in Australia, we didn't have grazers in Australia. We had, I don't know, what do you call it when they nibble? Like browsers. Browsers. We had browsers. Browsers, graziers feed on grass, browsers feed on browse, browsers shrubs, basically. So our, we had, but we called it grassland, but it was basically what looked like grassland. I went up to Bunnings recently or somewhere else recently where they had a, a, a plant shop. They got all their plants. They got a table there at Bunnings. It's titled... Grass, grass, yeah. grasses, grasses, grasses. There isn't a grass There's on There's not it. a single grass. There's yeah. not a single species of grass on the whole table. <laughs> and what about iron grass? <laughs> that's all right. I don't that's mind. A, that's They're city mantra. slickers. They wouldn't know grass from a tiger, sort of thing. <laughs> so it's called grass. But anyway, that's all. So, but in gra our grasslands here. 80% of the plants are what we call grassland plants. They're plants that grow in what looks like grassland. 80% of what's remaining, that's 16% of shrubs of the species and 4% of trees. If you stop the management, you can only have grasslands if there's being eaten. Grasslands because of it's kept grassland. The bush doesn't want it to be grasslands. The bush wants the other things. So what happens is that we, if you change the management so the grassland doesn't stay, which has happened here in the Adelaide Hills everywhere, you change from grassland to shrubland. Changing from grassland to shrubland, you lose 80% of your plants. It's as simple as that. You lose all your biodiversity. It's all gone. Yep. So you've got to make a decision. What do you want? Nobody decides what we want. If you're a birdo, you want scrub because the scrub protects birds, or you think it does. And it certainly protects the birds away from cats a bit of that. So you've got all these problems to have what we want. you first of all got to think about what you're going to do with foxes and cats and things like that, and other things, pigs and goats and camels and horses and donkeys. You can go on and on. There's plenty of them. And I see there was a blackbird here a minute ago, and bloody Indian miners if you go over to Sydney and on and on the list goes. 
what do you do with invasive organisms? But not only what do you do with invasive organisms, you've got your own plants, you've got indigenous plants that are woody weeds that will take over if they're not controlled by something. And if they take over, you lose your biodiversity. So it's not just a matter of if it's indigenous, it's okay. You've got to go a step further than that. We haven't got to that stage yet. Or we're getting there, I think. We'll get there, but maybe it'll be too late. I'll tell you what, John, you're ahead of your time. You've dedicated the last 40, 50 years to educating others by example and by philosophies about the bush. You tried to educate, I think it was the Stirling Council, with a Dr Zeus book? Yeah. Yeah, I actually... I actually got nominated and went into Stirling Council in July 1973 to save the orchids on Stock Road was my main thing. But as soon as I got into Stirling Council, I soon realised there were other issues than just Stock Road orchids. They, for example, at that time had written council policy to clear and level the roads and plant with exotics and they were doing it. Our local conservation group here in the hills was the Mount Lofty Rangers Association. The Mount Lofty Rangers Association at that time in 1972-3 were planting liquid ambers on the roadsides of the district. That's what they saw as their job. So you shouldn't be ashamed of being an Englishman. We were all Englishmen not long ago, you see. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, for being hard on your mate. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> so I was faced with a council of people who had no idea of what I was talking about when I said anything. I can remember there one, it became very clear one night there the majority of Stirling councillors didn't know the difference between a native plant and an, ind- and an introduced plant. They didn't know an indigenous plant from a non-indigenous plant. They didn't know an exotic plant to them was a plant that everybody thought was exotic, that was nice. So... It didn't have anything to do with where it came from or anything. So this is how their decision... So actually they had this policy to plant exotics when actually nobody in the council understood even what an exotic was. (laughs) So so that was the whole reason why they went for exotics. It's just education, not because of looks or ease Uh, Exotics, they had exotic because exotic to them sounded... Nice, right. nice we, plants. We still see that today in the yeah. um, with vets, veterinarians. They an exotic animal would be a kangaroo or a snake because in their practice, that's an exotic yes. animal. They That'd don't see right. it very often. That'd be right. Yeah. So it comes up with different things. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I was clear that I had to somehow get them to my level to understanding, and the best I could do was. Can't have the law. The best I could do was to read them the Lorax. So I bought them. <laughs> I went in there. I think there were I don't know. There were eight councillors, and and there was a, a clerk at a thing. So I went in there with a dozen copies of Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. I gave them a copy each, and I read it to them, <laughs> and they thought it was wonderful. And I read to them, on the night, they were discussing whether they'd give approval to someone to clear their frontage and plant exotic sorts. <laughs> so I read it to them. At the end of it, uh, Councillor Forbes said, that was lovely, now gets on with this. I move that we be, be allowed to clear the trees. So oh, wow. Instantly. Instantly. <laughs> so it was all very interesting. <laughs> so I can tell you I got into some debates on Stirling Council and further and that's where I got ended up getting into serious trouble over that. There were other things I got sued for defamation a number of times and oh it was wonderful, wonderful goings on But your commitment to what you wanted to achieve, you just, you had no choice but to keep going? Well I often get asked why I did this and I simply 
do this, what I'd do, I'd do, because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. It's got nothing to do with anything else. I suppose the, the, they talk about, you know, if, you, if you're good... If you're good, you die and go to heaven. If you're bad, you die and go to hell. Well, if you believe in that you're reborn, that if you really want to be punished, you're reborn and you're given a conscience. That's the way it works because you live in a life of hell if you're in the world today with a conscience. Is a... The Sterling Council in 1973, when I joined it, was run basically by a group of people who ran the council for their own benefit financially. It wasn't run. Corruption was the word I was looking for. The Stirling Council was corrupt, as is many things. And corruption is an interesting thing, but the biggest, one of the biggest problems facing the world is corruption. And it's, a, it's one of the things that is, of, is a big problem. So I ran it on a corrupt council and it was hard work, I can tell you. It's a tricky one, isn't it? A lot of people, even just getting back to basics with planting native plants in your garden and having a nesting box and all these kinds of things and do I use a local native, do I use an Australian native and all those arguments that we know a lot about but the average punter, they're trying to live their life, Mm. raise their kids, Mm. um, get to work on time. Mm. Um, So... That's why it's great that you do this, live by example. The, the biggest compliment I ever had, I had a native garden in my previous house uh, at Mount Barker and it was just a quarter acre block and I had removed pretty much every weed from that block. It was lawn when I moved in. I had about 100 species, mostly ground covers, had a few shrubs along the fence and a little pond and that was great. The biggest compliment I had was from my neighbour that said, oh, I want to do that now. Like he didn't, mm. if I had told him about it, he wouldn't understand. But because he saw it, he went, You've Whoa. Yeah. You know, he'd lived there for, in, in his house for 20 years with yeah. lawn and a couple of shrubs, and he'd, he'd seen what I had going on. He was like, Wow. He could see plants coming up of their own volition. Mm. He could see the, the invertebrates, that, just that intrinsic element, you know. Um, he, mm. Yeah, that was, that was that for me. That was good. Yeah. Well, I found that that was the only way, really, when it came to the crunch to get through the people. You can talk all you like, you don't get anywhere. In fact, belief system's a funny thing. People have got a belief system and you can't change a person's belief by talking to them. You can change their belief by showing them. Hmm. And I found the only thing that ever worked was showing people the result of the difference, what you could achieve if you wanted to. I agree with that. I had an example recently when I bought um, my property just around the corner from you here. I've got three acres of bush, as I mentioned, and my friend Sean, he's a, he's a crazy herpetologist. He loves reptiles, and he said, you should lay tiles down in this property to attract reptiles. And at the time, I actually thought, nah, there's that much habitat here. Why would I do that? Yeah. And then he, he gave me... Um, some coordinates for a tile site that um, that he manages and I went there and I flipped over about 40 tiles and just about every second tile was being utilised by a frog or mm. a snake or a gecko yeah. or a skink and I was like, yeah. this is really good and it's analogous yeah. to tree nesting hollows in the trees until you see them working mm. um, yeah. you know, it's hard to see it in your mind until you see it in, in yeah. real life so a lot of these animals we were talking about, uh, we talked about platypus and um, betongs and um, different species you put they're extinct in the wild in South Australia like they're gone from the wild yeah um, another, another one that comes to mind numbats yeah and you were responsible for bringing numbats back yeah. to South Australia as well yes can you tell us a little bit about that John I'm oh, sorry, sorry I didn't interrupt for those that don't know I mean there are probably people that don't know what a numbat is small little marsupial sticky yeah. uppy tail stripes yeah. comes out in the daytime eats termites yeah it's got a pointy nose it's feeds exclusively on termites it can quite small one it can fit on your hand got a bushy tail a tanny coloured stripes various stripes on it very alert very uh, dances round sort of thing very always either stationary or moving you know? and they when we bought the Yukamura Sanctuary the old Mallee there was very high in termites. Termites, there's literally oh, thousands of species of termites. So when you talk about termites, you tend to think about the ones that eat your house down. There's only a couple of species that eat your house down. 
most termites uh, out there, you wouldn't know they were there. Uh, one of the interesting things about termites, though, is there's a greater mass of termites in the world than there are people, and yet they don't cause anywhere near the damage that people cause, do they? So it's interesting. But anyway, because there were termites there and because Nubatch once lived there, then one of the things that I want to bring back, because my aim was to try and get that... I was trying to get back balance, the balance that we had. It was about can you do this and how do you do it, what do you do? So when I did Warrawong Sanctuary, there was a problem getting balance. It was a bit small. And so I went to up to the next stage of a 1,000 hectares at Yokomara Sanctuary. Um, so one of the things was uh, numbats, and, but by that time it was getting reasonably easy for me to get Western Australian animals because of the success that I'd had with the brush-tail beton. The brush-tail beton, once I'd demonstrated that I could, as I did with that, that it could be saved, and then it was really only a matter of asking for the numbats from Western Australia, and they they came. So they came from Western Australia. Um, we had to do tests. We had to prove that there were the termites there that they and uh, was I can't remember how many, but about a dozen numbats turned up one day. Were released up there, and they they just thrived. The... I was I was there two years ago with Tamara, and uh, we were helping on a biological survey. And one of the rangers that uh, lives at the park said that he was on the outside of the fence and saw a numbat. Yeah, yeah. So obviously he climbed over the oh, fence. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That used to, here at Warrawong, um, you guys used to breed hundreds of quolls mm. and people were finding quolls. Yeah, yeah. I actually saw one at Mark Oliphant Conservation Park in yeah. the middle of the day, an eastern quoll. Yeah. Yes, if you had these sort of... That's one of the things that I always want to do. For example, on the... The uh, southern brown bandicoot. This is the last of the southern brown bandicoots left in the world, uh, in this area, sort of thing. They're doing reasonably well, so it's all right. But one of the things you can do to help them is just have safe areas for them. And the best way to do a safe area for a bandicoot is just to have a, a mesh area of two-inch mesh, so and the bandicoot can go through the mesh, but cats and foxes can't, or <laughs> it's harder for them to go through. So you can have, you can have, but I don't know, I've never got these off the ground, but anyway, but that certainly shows that how it would work with, and it's like the platypus leaving Warrawong. There's about three or four platypus leave Warrawong every year, but they'd be ones when they're evicted and they don't get far and they get eaten by foxes, which is a bit of a shame, but anyway. Yeah, there's a lot of people that say they see platypus around even, even still today. Um, yeah. They would be coming from Warrawong. Well, I'd be surprised if they weren't in Mount Boulder as well, for example. I, th I think they would have got there by now and survived there. It's fantastic. Following the success of the Western Quoll in the Flinders Ranges, they've released some, no fences at all, fox yeah. controlling, yeah. Um, you know, controlling the cats, and they're yeah. succeeding, they're breeding. Do you think something like that could happen in the Adelaide Hills, maybe oh, in yeah. Mount Bold? Oh, yeah, I think it's a disaster that we don't have feral control in the Adelaide Hills, especially now they've got uh, reasonable cat control with, with uh, baits. They've got a bait now that cats love. Uh, which we didn't have before. Cats are basically hunters. They're very hard to tempt to eat something that's dead. But somebody's come up with something that cats can't resist. And uh, they're now using that very successfully up in the Flinders and areas where there was, uh, where the, they got cameras set up and where there was once you'd pick up a number of cats a night on these things. Now you don't see a cat. And so it's really good what's happening there. So we now can do it and we should be doing it. We don't do it in the Adelaide Hills. There's no fox control in the Adelaide Hills, which is an absolute disaster. And I don't know why. Oh, they run them up. They're in the square mile of Adelaide. Mm. There's yeah. nowhere without a fox. Well, I understand why they don't bait them in Adelaide. They've got another problem there with another species that far worse than the rabbits. But anyway... 
What's that? Humans? Yeah, <laughs> humans. <laughs> you, always, you always encounter somebody when you talk about controlling cats and foxes, they'll always be, it's normally a cat lover, and they'll jump up and say, well, humans are the worst. Oh, so are. when you start culling them, I'll worry about the cats. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, they, so they have these methods now, and they could be doing that. The Numbat story was a good one. Not the Numbat, the Bilby story was a good one, that the getting of Bilbies here because that was probably my hardest job later. Once it was got fairly easy to get animals after a while, I could prove they were used to be here, uh, demonstrate that I knew what I was doing, which I'd done with what I'd done, and go to, say, Western Australia, Western Australia, Actually, I had a very good relationship with Western Australia. They knew that if they gave me stuff, it would survive and thrive. So I had no trouble. Uh, Bilbies were Northern Territory. They're not in Western Australia. They're in Northern Territory, and Bilbies used to live here. And so I wanted some Bilbies, and I tried and tried with Bilbies without any success. But I used to make a lot of noise, and I was very... I used to persevere with these things. I didn't say, can I have Bilbies? No, and then forget about it. Did I have Bilbies? No. What's my next step? How do I get these Bilbies? So I ended up on the radio debating with the head of the National Parks and the Northern Territory over getting Bilbies. And he spent about 10 minutes explaining to me why I couldn't have bilbies. And then I spent 10 minutes explaining to him why I should have bilbies. And I I should have bilbies because I just stated the record for number of bilbies in Northern Territory and the numbers each year, how they were coming down, and that under his care, Bilbies would become extinct and under my care I gave the records on what I'd done and under my care Bilbies would increase in number and therefore I should have some Bilbies. Don't mess with the doctor of mathematics on these things. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, he ended up, he, it got too much for him and he exploded. He said, all right, you can have your bloody Bilbies. <laughs> <laughs> and the commentator on the radio said to him do you mean this do you mean this he said yes yes i mean it i mean it those parks are all owned by the australian wildlife conservancy now and i believe they do a very good job um managing those parks one of the things i was a little bit sad to hear that they don't actually offer any tourism in those parks which i think if balanced correctly could be a great thing we've talked about people need to see these Mm. things to really understand them um, are you a bit sad that they don't open to the public? It's a, it's a difficult thing. I don't know, see, but when they took over our sanctuaries, they basically made a deal with the Federal Department of Environment that they wouldn't show them off. Now, if I got wow. the billions of dollars of assistance that they get, I would never have had to sell them and they'd still be open to the public. Such a shame because Yukimura Sanctuary has a, like a little uh, restaurant yeah. They used to have jazz nights. There's a wombat playing the saxophone on the window to this day. Yeah. And there are cabins where you can stay the night. And you're yeah. not impacting the animals at all. No, well, no. Same at Scotia, but there's no one there. So that's the problem, but that's the rule. That's the way it is. It's as simple as that. Sorry. So we'll make you environmentalist of the year and shut That was the parting thing. That's the deal that I got for bowing out. That was my last year. That My deal was that I wouldn't tell the world that they did it <laughs> just have sorry <laughs> just have <laughs> yeah well i've see, as i get older as i get older i'm i'm 80 in a few months time happy birthday wow and i, I don't give a stuff anymore what they do to me <laughs> if they even if they put me down it won't matter that much because i'm no bloody good for anything now anyway <laughs> <laughs> i think you do more than most mate yes absolutely Bye-bye.